Hi, my name is Marie Arana, and I'm the Literary Director of the Library of Congress, and I'm talking to you here in the members' room at the Library of Congress, where I happen to be sitting with, virtually, uh, John Grisham, the wonderful, absolutely marvelously successful uh, American author. We're so proud of him. John, welcome. Happy to be here. Now, I have to start out by saying um, that you were the first winner of the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction, which at the time went by a different name. I think it was called the Creative Achievement Award, the Library of Congress's Creative Achievement Award. But you were the first. And then who followed was a, a pretty nice cal cavalcade of um, Philip Roth and Toni Morrison and E.L. Doctorow and um, Isabel Allende, Marilyn Robinson, uh, Louis Erdrich, a whole wonderful line. But you were the original one. You were the first one. Um, so how does it uh, feel to be a Library of Congress original? Well, thank you for the award. You gave it to me 20 years ago. Right. Uh, happy, <laughs> happy to receive it. It was very prestigious. And uh, when you mention, you know, when you write popular fiction, uh, you don't always get a lot of awards. Uh, you get rewarded elsewhere, but not, not when it comes to literary awards uh, on literary merit. And so it was very uh, touching to get the first award some 20 years ago. Well, your writing is uh, more, I think, than, than the popular genre. It is um, a very crafted, very wonderful, and I would say in every sense of the word, literary. Um, and we're very, we were very, very happy actually to, to sort of plant that seed of, uh, of John Grisham as being the first. So um, you don't need an introduction from me. You have published more than 40 books uh, for in, in really every genre for children and adults and all kinds of things. Your books have been made into movies. You've sold, I th think, more than, well, hundreds of millions of books around the world, and they've been published in more than 50 languages. So um, from this promontory, John, from this great promontory of, of really success in reaching so many people, um, how, how do you reflect on that as somebody who has actually been such a force in people's lives that they have read your work and they have absorbed your messages? Well, Marie, there's no way to, uh... You know, looking back, I didn't plan this. It just happened. Um, I planned, you know, I was a lawyer in a small town in Mississippi uh, 30 years ago, and I wrote a book called Time to Kill that nice. didn't sell. It was a complete flop, and uh, I thought the career was going nowhere. Um, I promised myself, I vowed to write one more book, and if the second book didn't work, I was going to forget that little secret hobby and just go on and be a full-time lawyer, as I was anyway, or maybe a judge or something. Uh, but I, there's no way I could have then uh, looked forward and, and, and predicted all of this. It just, it's, it's overwhelming. Although at the time it's, you know, it's been 30 years and I've done a, a book a year, at least one book a year for 30 years. And I'll do, you know, I'll do probably two books this year and probably two next. I, it's just, it's what I do. Um, but as the books became more and more popular and the movies really fuel the early uh, spike in popularity, and those, and those movies are still on TV somewhere tonight and still very popular, and they still sell a lot of books. Um, over the years, I've just um, tried to use the, the not a platform and not a soapbox and not a pulpit, but a, a, a way of raising awareness about certain issues that really trouble me, um, especially dealing with criminal justice and criminal justice reform and criminal injustice in our system. Uh, because that's what I understand because I, I'm a lawyer. I was a lawyer for, for a long, for 10 years in a small town. That's where my interest is. And I love to read stories about lawyers and trials and, and lawsuits and law firms and courts and appeals and cases. And that's what, that's where I hang out. And when you, when you live there, there's no shortage of good material. And there's, so, there's some issues I care uh, about deeply. And, and I've written about those and, and it's a way of, uh, telling great stories, which is, which is the ultimate goal every time I start to write is to tell a great story. Um, but also if it, if it works properly, it can be very suspenseful, very enjoyable and very um, um, informative. It can, it can raise awareness because of, um, can raise awareness for certain issues 
And I think as I have um, uh, gotten older or matured, uh, I've been more concerned about writing um, about more serious issues. And at the same time, I'll get bored with, or as my wife says, get off your soapbox and just write a fun book. So I'll write a, a kid's book or I'll write a sports book or I'll write, uh, a, as we call, we call them around the house, we call them small books. These are, these are small books, the big books of the legal thrillers. I'm just, uh, I'm still, I'm living a dream that I can wake up each day and think about what to write next. And, you know, I'm only 65. So if I stay healthy, I plan to keep doing it. Well, you talk about the books that you care about, and um, I want to talk about that some more. Uh, we, we're going to talk about these two books, um, John Grisham's The Guardians and John Grisham's Camino Wins. And I have to tell you, I had a lot of fun reading these. Um, they are absolutely entertaining, but more than fun they struck me as incredibly timely. I mean, you talk in both of them about race, which is something that we're having a national reckoning about right now at, at this time um, in our nation. You talk a lot about justice and injustice. You talk a lot about, uh, and especially in Camino Winds, you talk about a society in the middle of a catastrophe because there's a hurricane that blows through, a major hurricane that blows through Camino Island. And so these are, even though we are being entertained, we are, you know, in the very thick of this time. And I wonder to what extent, um, I mean, you could not have predicted these things. You could not have predicted the pandemic or uh, this national reckoning that we're having right now with race. But how do you see it as um, your books as being a mirror to these? Because they really, truly are. Well, unfortunately, some issues uh, have plagued our country forever. Uh, you know, slavery is our greatest sin, and we are still dealing with that today, or not dealing with it, with, with the, the issue of race. And you can, and that's, all, that's always going to be timely, because the race is so complicated in this country. And there are so many, my first book was a story about, you know, extreme racial conflict in the Deep South. And that was 30 some odd years ago. And, you know, at, at times you look around and you say, well, we've come so far. And then you, the next day you say, well, we have, we have so far to go. Uh, have, what, what have we really accomplished? And um, uh, that, that, those stories are, they, all, they almost tell themselves. Um, and when you write about wrongful convictions, and I've done that several times before, even in a nonfiction book, a true story, uh, you realize how, uh, how race is a huge factor at every stage of the criminal justice system from profiling to arrest, to posting bail, to, um, to sentencing, to trial, guilt, innocence, and especially wrongful convictions. I'm on the board of the Innocence Project in New York. I have been for 12 years and we have, I think our number is 370 DNA exonerations in the past 25 years. That's may sound like a small number because there are thousands of innocent people in prison, but these cases are extremely hard to, to win. It's, it's, I've said before, it's much easier to send an innocent person to prison than it is to get one out, uh, even with DNA testing. But uh, when you study these cases and you realize that black suspects are simply treated differently than white suspects right from the very beginning, and race, uh, race is a factor in so many of these uh, cases. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I write about that. In The Guardians, there were two or three cases. There's one central case and two or three others that I, that I kind of go into some detail. But th that book was inspired by a real person who, for 40 years, did what uh, the hero of the book does. He just traveled the country, taking one case after another, uh, cases in which he was convinced that, the, that his clients were innocent. And most of them were not DNA cases. And DNA cases, as difficult as they are to win, they're still easier because you have clear biological proof that you know you you can hang your head on. But most cases are not DNA cases. Most deal with um, uh, no blood, no stare, not nothing left behind. And you have to go back to the scene of the crime and talk to the witnesses. And it's tedious, long work that takes years. And Jim McCluskey did it for 40 years out of Princeton and his nonprofits there. And he freed 63 people who would be locked up today if not for him. Just an amazing story. I met him 25 years ago. 
And I always wanted to write a book about him. And that's what I did with The Guardians. Well, your, your hero, Cullen Post, is a real uh, reflection of that uh, respect that you have for McCloskey. And I, I remember, remember seeing, as I started the book, the dedication to McCloskey, and I didn't know who he was. And I read all the way to the end and found out who he was in your, in your uh, post sort of mm -hmm. acknowledgments. But I also, there was also a case, and it's a pending case in Texas, that um, I remember reading about it. And suddenly I had uh, echoes of it as I was reading The Guardians, the, the, the case of the um, fellow in Texas who was accused of killing his wife and yeah. is still in prison. Um, Joe Bryan has served for 35 years and uh, the evidence against him is so, there's no fiscal evidence against him uh, he could, because he didn't kill his wife. He was uh, two hours away in a hotel in Austin when she was murdered by an intruder. And the case was botched by the local cops in so many different ways. The prosecutor would not look at the other. Anyway, Joe, Joe served uh, for 35 years for somebody else's murder. Luckily, 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 Joe was paroled after his 13th uh, request back in March at the age of almost 80 and he's in bad health. Uh, but he was paroled finally by the Texas Board of Parole, which is a tough bunch. Um, and he walked out just in time for a COVID-19, but he's uh, happy to be out. He's thrilled. I talk to him all the time. He's thrilled to be out. He lives with his brother in Houston, Texas, and he's got a few good years left and he's going to enjoy them. But I mean, think about that. They, they, they now have a, a very good suspect in the murder that goes back to 1985, uh, but it's far too late to convict anyone. And it's another, another wasted life because of, um, all the factors that lead into wrongful convictions. And we, we, we have not cleaned that mess up. Okay, we could, if we had the political will to do it, we could pass laws that would almost uh, eliminate wrongful convictions, but we won't do that. Well, it's, it's really interesting to me because you, I think your hero, Colin Post says something like, it's really, really easy to convict somebody and it's devilishly hard to exonerate somebody. And mm -hmm. of course, what that takes, and you prove so well in, in The Guardians, um, is, an incredible amount of sort of in investigative, what investigative journalists do, um, yeah. what of course the legal profession does. The, the extreme kind of logic that needs to go in to what, the, what you're gathering, how you're going to prove it, uh, all of that that goes into, into play in, in a case like that. But I would, also add that you, as an author, as a writer of this kind of thriller fiction, mystery fiction, um, also are employing a kind of very, very um, uh, sort of determined and focused logic as you go forward. You have to keep all the pieces going in the same way as you would do were you handling this case. Oh, yeah. I mean, when you write a book, when you write suspense, when you write uh, a thriller with a complicated plot, you've got several balls in the air. You've got several plots, subplots, uh, always circulating and you've got to, you've got to pay attention to those. Uh, that's why it's so, it's so important to, uh, to carefully plan the book, uh, just from a pure, a pure work plan, a, 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 an outline, an idea for the book. You've got to have it. I, I do. So other writers don't, but I do I have to have it very carefully laid out from start to finish before I start. Uh, because when you, when you know where you're going, it's, it's very hard to get lost. If you don't know the ending, it's very easy to get lost as a writer. It happens all the time. And people waste a lot of time in books they can't finish because they just got in too big of a hurry. It's not unusual to have a brilliant idea and start writing because you're so inspired. It's just great. But then you, write for a year and you've got 50,000 words or more and suddenly you realize you, you don't know what the ending is going to be. And it's total panic, total fear, total, you know, it can really mess with you. And a lot of those books are not finished. And I, you know, I learned that lesson a long time ago. And so, but you, you really have to, you, you have to plan the uh, suspense. It's all about pacing. It's all about plotting. It's all about keeping the pages turning. And that's what uh, I want the reader to do. I, I want you to lose sleep at night and call in late for work and all that kind of, to finish the book. So with this logic and this sense of reason that you're constantly struggling with because you have to make all these pieces fit and there are a million things because you also want 
readers not to know where you're going necessarily. They have to be, there have to be false leads as well. And you're planning all of this so that you're getting to the end that you want to get to. Um, do you ever have readers who say, well, you know, this little bit over here doesn't really make sense and where you're, you're called on your logic, you're actually called to the mat to reason something out? It's kind of hard to call me out because I don't go out. It's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to pin me down because I don't really uh, expose myself to, to a lot of the readers. Uh, what I don't like is when readers say, oh, I had this thing figured out halfway through. I oh. knew where this was going halfway through. And I just don't believe that. I, I, maybe, maybe so. The, the ending has got to be, you've got to have a very captivating opening, the hook. You've got to get the reader involved. Uh, and you've got to have, uh, you've got to maintain the narrative tension with subplots and, and pacing to lead to an ending that is not predictable. You, you don't want the reader to know halfway through or two thirds through where it's going. You want it to be a little bit different uh, but the ending had better work. It better be plausible uh, without being predictable. And that's, that's always, and every time I write a book, even with all the planning and outlining that I go into, uh, at some point in the story, uh, usually just beyond the halfway point, uh, I get really scared. I get really nervous about, you know, is this, is this plausible? Is it workable? Is it, is it compelling? Is it, fun to read? Is it, is the ending going to work? And, you know, so you go through uh, periods of, of self-doubt with every book, even, you know, even at this level, I, it's, there's some terrifying moments when you, when you think, okay, um, I don't think I've written uh, a really bad book yet, a real dud. <laughs> I don't think so. Others would say I probably have a bunch of them, but, it, but uh, I'm terrified this is going to happen one day. And, my wife reads the book first and my editor reads the book and they're going to say, John, this thing is not working. You can't, it's just a terrible book. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do when that happens. I don't think that's going to happen, John. <laughs> I wouldn't worry well, about it too much. <laughs> well, we, we, have, we, have, we have some safeguards in place. Uh, the first safeguard is my wife who, has, who reads every book, uh, you know, almost, almost like an editor. And at, before I actually start writing a book, uh, and we still do this after 44 books, um, I'll say, I need five minutes. She'll say, okay, get off the phone, put the phone down. Uh, and I, ha I have to pitch this idea. I have to pitch the story, which is a great exercise uh, because if you can't pitch your story in you know, a few minutes, you're probably in trouble. If, right. you go, if it's too complicated, it goes on too long. Um, uh, we, we still laugh about the time when I pitched the firm to her uh, many years ago. She was in the kitchen. And I said, hey, I got an idea for the book, the next book. I was finishing the time to kill and she said, what is it? And I gave the 30 second pitch for the firm and she just stopped and she said, um, do that one more time, do it again. And I pitched it again and she said, that is a huge book. And that's how the firm got started. Uh, and, and it so, is, she was right. She was right, it is a huge book. <laughs> it has been a huge book at 30, 30 years later. <laughs> right. So what, did she play a part in, uh, did Renee play a part in Camino Wins? Did she? Uh, I mean, this is a really fun book. It's basically, and it's so much fun for me yeah. and for lots of people who are in the book industry or in the reading industry, well, the, the sort of, the, the, it's, it's, all, it's all a bookseller and a bookseller's life, right? And yeah, so it's, it's really, it's really uh, she, she was involved in the first Camino, Camino Island because we were driving to Florida about four years ago, our annual summer trip. We, we pack up the car and take off to, to a place in Florida we always go to. And we were listening to NPR and we listened to books on tape and we had the dog and we, it's, our, it's our annual pilgrimage, our vacation. We love, we love to do it. And we take turns driving and napping. And we had just uh, listened to NPR and there was a, this great story about the theft of some rare books uh, from some library in Europe and how they caught the how they pulled off the theft. And so we were inspired. So we started talking about, forget legal thrillers, forget kids' books. How, how could you fashion a, uh, uh, just a good old mystery around the theft of rare books or rare manuscripts? And so we kept talking and, and we kind of got into it. And so it, we'd bounced around for the whole week. I stayed, I did research all week and pulled up stories about the theft of rare, it's quite common. It's quite common because libraries are not known for their strict security, you know, over the years. They are, they're getting better now. 
Uh, there'd been some great thefts uh, from personal collections and rare books. Who can you imagine stealing books? And so that's where the inspiration came from. And so I pitched the idea of the story. She loved the idea of the bookstore, the group of writers who hang out around this bookstore in a small town in Florida. The bookstore is patterned after my favorite bookstore in the world, Square Books in Oxford, right. Mississippi. Uh, so I just took that bookstore and I put it in, in Santa Rosa, the fictional town. So yeah, Renee was very much involved with that. And by the time I published the book uh, three years ago, uh, she and I both were talking about the next one the next book in, in the series. I don't know how long the series is going to go. I sold two more books to Doubleday. Camino Wins is the first of two. There will be another one in a couple of years. So we're talking now, and, and we have some very good ideas. But Camino, the Camino series is something we talk about openly. Uh, the kids series, the Theodore Boone series, has become a family project. There are seven of those books now. And we're always over dinner, drinks away with the kids, always kicking around an idea for the next Theo book. And so... That's what we kind of launch on and dine on around our house. That's great. Uh, I love the image. Uh, I want you to know, though, that we have great security here at the Library of Congress. <laughs> Nothing's better. getting out you of better. here fast, uh, that's for sure. But, you know, I wanted to, um, to ask you because, well, two things about Camino Wins, because it's not just book selling. You also get into assisted living facilities and the, um, the sort of rampant negligence that goes on there. And you sort of get at it in a very curious way. How did that come into your head? How, what was the seed of that? Yeah, that's, that's pretty much all uh, fiction. I, uh, I, have a, I have an aunt uh, who years ago worked in a, in a sort of a low end nursing home the, and the only Alzheimer's wing, and the stories are pretty horrific. And she, she would tell us how they go to great lengths to keep these people alive just one more month, drag them to the finish line one more month so they can bill Medicare uh, for three or 4,000 bucks. And, and I mean, you want to keep the people alive forever, although these people, um, it brings up the right to die issue too that I have not really explored, but I feel very strongly about because, and I've seen, we've all seen some of these people who are so far gone mentally that they don't know where they are and, and, and yet they continue to, to hang on and hang on and hang on. And, and so that was sort of the background. The, the fictional drug that helps prolong lives all, that's all just, you know, a figment of the author's imagination. Good. I'm glad that it doesn't exist. It's a pretty but, scary drug. <laughs> I hope so. I hope it's fictional. <laughs> so, um, but one thing that really is reflected so nicely in this book is friendship between authors and the friendships that develop in the whole book writing thing. I mean, book, uh, writing is a solitary. I mean, yes, you, you discuss ideas over your dinner table and with your kids and with Renee, but um, basically when push comes to shove, you're sitting at your desk and you're writing the thing and it's, you're alone and you write alone and the reader reads alone. I mean, these are, there are several things that you do in life that you do alone, Let, get born, die and read right. and write. Right. And right. so um, what, I want to ask you is these wonderful relationships that come out uh, that writers have and booksellers have with writers and writers with other writers. Do you have these relationships yourself? I was influenced by uh, two things that have happened to me so far in the last 30 years. We moved to Oxford in 1990 and we'd gone to school at Ole Miss. We even got married in Oxford. Went back to our hometown about an hour away just outside of Memphis. And that's where we lived and I practiced law and we had our kids and all that. And then once we had the chance, we moved back to Oxford, which it's a beautiful little college town. And we moved there in 1990. The bookstore was up and running big time. Willie Morris was the writer and resident at Ole Miss. Uh, Barry Hanna was teaching at Ole Miss. Larry Brown had just broken out and gotten you know, pretty famous. And Richard Holworth, who owns the bookstore, was on the national circuit. And all the writers came through Oxford, all the big tours. And we met all, I met all of us by hanging around the bookstore. And it was not unusual to go uh, to the bookstore late afternoon for a signing and and the writers there, the, all the other writers in town, a bunch of readers are there, fans are there. For these wonderful book parties that would go on for a long time, maybe even long dinners. I'll never forget 1994 when Donna Tartt published her first novel, The Secret History. She's from, she's from Mississippi. She went to Ole Miss. 
and it was a grand homecoming for her. And the store was packed and the, I had read the book. I just loved the book. And we went out for a long dinner afterwards and it was just her editor from New York and her publisher. And, you know, that was, it was that environment uh, in 1990. We left uh, and moved here 25 years ago. And yeah, it's, it's hard to find, it's hard to hang out with the writers because they're a bunch of weirdos for the most part. There's, their strains are different. They, they do work along, they think along and, and it, yeah, it's, it's difficult. However, I have found some friends here um, we have a group of writers here in Charlottesville because there are a lot of writers here and uh, we were hanging out more, uh, talking more, lunching more, drinking better wines. And when we're together, we, it's all about, uh, you know, what are you working on? Uh, what has your agent done lately? What has your publisher done lately? What's the gossip or what have you read? You know, what good book have you read? And so we, we have a number of those long lunches uh, in the course of the year. Speaking of relationships with, with authors, um, is there, when you were starting out, was there an author that you admired, that you wanted to be like, or that you took ideas from? You, you, you know, you, you were sort of inventing a genre here. Um, and so I wonder whether there are ancestors to your books. I, I, I'm not sure I can answer that. I'll tell you a story. Um, in 1987, I was trying to finish A Time to Kill, and I was very disheartened by it um, because it is, at that point, I was a very busy lawyer in a small town. I wasn't making any money, but I had a lot of clients, and my clients couldn't pay me, so I, but I stayed busy, and it took a lot of hours. I was also in the state legislature in Mississippi. I'd been elected, and I didn't have a lot of time. My wife was having babies, so life was fun. Life was good. The only time I could write was, you know, early in the morning, real early, and I did that for a number of years. But, um, I, you know, I was, I'd put the book down, and uh, I did, I, The Time to Kill was the first thing I'd ever written in my life. I, I, I'd never dreamed of being a writer. It was not a childhood dream. It was not something I studied in college. It was just something that came later in life when I was a lawyer. And I would stop writing the book, and finally, eventually, Renee would say, okay, where's, you know, where's the next chapter? And I would get back to the table. And, but anyway, it was, you know, I was having a hard time finishing the book. And once I finished, I didn't know what I was going to do with it. Um, and in 1987, Scott Turow published uh, Presumed Innocent. And it was a monster book. It was right. a huge book, huge bestseller. Scott was all over the place. I read the book, loved it. I thought this guy can write. This guy can tell a story. This is this is really and all these wonderful things were happening to Scott because of that, and it was uh, extremely motivational. It really got me fired up to finish uh, a time to kill and then go into the next book. And and so that was one moment in life uh, where I was uh, really inspired by. It. And Scott and I have become friends. I've told that story many times, and we hang out whenever we can. Uh, but he's he had a huge impact on. on yeah, yeah, and I, I see, I see, yeah, an echo there as well. Um, I want to ask you because you know there are clear heroes in your books. They, um, whether they're men or women, uh, there are there are heroes who stand up and do the right thing and um, and fight against the odds to do the right thing. But there are also lots of bad actors. There are bad cops. There are corrupt lawyers. There are. Um, uh, forensic hacks who, you know, mm -hmm. pretend to do the work but don't. Um, and there's a lot of uh, money under the table and all of that. Uh, you're obviously um, very passionate about uh, justice being done in the right ethical way. Uh, and But we learn a lot about, um, you know, the, the, the bad ways things can happen in the right. law. Right. Um, so I want to ask you, because the, the theme of this festival is American ingenuity, and um, your heroes, of course, turn out to be not only um, heroic and doing the right thing, but also ingenious in their way. Mm. And so I want to ask you about your thoughts on what ingenuity is and how that plays into your, into your heroes and your heroines. Well, I think when you talk about ingenuity in the criminal justice system, I'm not sure we need a lot of ingenuity as much as we need the political will 
to fix the problems that we can, we can clearly, clearly identify. We know they're there. Uh, we know how to fix them. Uh, we could pass eight different laws in this country that would make uh, wrongful convictions almost completely go away. They're never going to go out together. It would save zillions of, zillions of dollars, <laughs> the money the savings. It would save lives. It would save human capital. And it would uh, put guilty people in prison and keep innocent people out if we would just, if we had the will to do it. If we, ha if we had the will to abolish judicial elections, okay, judges should not be elected. Politics should be kept out of judicial elections and the judiciary, okay? We, we, if we did that, th but 35 states elect judges and it's a bad system and big money gets involved in these races. That's something, that's one way we could clean it up. Right? We'd have better judges if we would just do it. But there's, a, I mean, I could, I could go on for a long time about the ways, the steps we could take to clean up. Uh, I guess it would take ingenuity. I guess it would take, you know, some creative thinking, you know, sure. Uh, but we know what the problems are with criminal justice. We know, we know what, what leads to mass incarceration. We know what, why we have sentencing disparities. We know why the death penalty is unfair. We, we, th that's all been studied, not by me, but by people a lot smarter than me. I just read what they write. Uh, if, we, if we just had the um, guts and the will to do what was right, we could clean up this system. And I guess that can be considered to be ingenuity. Absolutely. Uh, beautifully put, by the way. Um, I don't want to uh, close this interview without talking about um, A Time for Mercy, which is coming out this fall. It's going to be coming out right at the time when we are launching the National Book Festival. So I want you to uh, talk to us a little bit about going back to that, uh, that place and uh, that sort of creative spot of uh, Time to Kill and well, talk, talk about good timing. I, uh, I, uh, about two hours ago, I finished the uh, final, final, final edits, <laughs> which, which is a one month process. Uh, and so I kissed the book goodbye for the last time. They have to, they give me a deadline because I'm, I would tinker with it forever if they, if they let me. And so they finally have to say to John, tomorrow is the last time you can change a single comma. Okay, so, so that's, that was today. So I'm done with it, but it's, I've lived with it now since, uh, since January. It's a return to Ford County. It's a return to Jake Brigance from A Time to Kill. It's, a, it's pretty much of a sequel of A Time to Kill, to A Time to Kill with a lot of the same characters. Um, Jake's back in the courtroom with another uh, highly controversial murder trial that he is in the middle of. And at first he doesn't want to be there. He doesn't want to take the case, but nobody else will take it. And in the course of representation of this, you know, this kid who's charged with murder, the whole town, uh, almost the whole town turns against Jake. And it's very, uh, it's very true in, in many cases where you have a very sensational, uh, controversial murder. Uh, the guilt of the murderer rubs off on the lawyer and the lawyer becomes a uh, target too. And that happens to Jake in A Time for Mercy. So uh, it's, you know what, I, I, I started the book in January because I started I started all the big books in January. And um, going back to that county and those people for the third time uh, or, or twice since the time to kill is uh, always a pleasure for me because that's where I'm from. And those are the people I know and the issues I understand, and it's it's always a great pleasure. I can't go back there with every book because no small town lawyer is going to have so many sensational murder trials in a career. But uh, I'd love to go back there and never leave. You know, um, Martin Luther King uh, famously quoted a Theodore Parker sermon that said, "The arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice." Yeah. And it's a wonderful quote. And uh, I'm thinking that in all your books, eventually, it bends toward justice. You bend it toward justice for us. And you give us hope in that justice. Um, do you have that same hope for justice? Do you think that that's where, that it's a reasonable goal to think 
of a perfect universe where justice is deployed in the way it should be? Yeah, I, I believe it can happen. I'm not sure it will happen. But we as Americans with our system, we have the ingenuity and the courage to, to make it happen. With time, uh, you talk about wrongful convictions. We've come so far with DNA testing and different laws that you know, we're, we're making a lot of progress. Uh, I'm, hoping that, I'm hoping that the next administration uh, is more committed to criminal justice reform. Uh, we were getting close a few years ago because the Democrats want reform for the sake of reform. Many Republicans want reform because they're tired of paying for 2 million people in prison. And so they were getting toward the middle of some meaningful criminal justice reform. And then 2016 happened. And then uh, if we can get back on the same page, we're going to see some real progress in criminal justice reform. And uh, I, I hope I'm there to write about it. I would not mind being there to be in the room if, if I could be of use to anybody. Uh, but that's, yeah, we can get there. We can, we can, we can do a lot to change the, the, some of the laws, some of the issues you, you see now being protested, some of the actions by the police. That, that can be corrected. That, that, that can all be fixed if we can just find the will to do it. Well, that is a wonderful, hopeful note to end on. And John, I just want to say in this 20th year of the National Book Festival, and in this 220th year that we're celebrating here at the Library of Congress, and to be here with you, who the very first winner of the Library of Congress Prize for Amer American Fiction, is a real pleasure and a real joy for me personally. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, the pleasure's mine. I enjoyed it. See you next time. Okay. <laughs> Thanks.